throughout it all, Laurel maintained his innocence. Yet his vehement defense only seemed to make Girard cling to the enticement explanation more firmly. Girard simply could not fathom that Crispin would want to leave of his own accord. This willful myopia, however, was challenged when news of Crispin's actual whereabouts finally reached Girard. In June 1795, so about eight months after Crispin had fled, two San Domingan exiles who had recently arrived to Philadelphia reported that they had seen Crispin in Port de Pay, a seaport in the northwestern region of the colony. Now, Port de Pay was a French Republican stronghold where residents fiercely repelled invading British forces and it provided a strategic harbor from which Republican Corsairs attacked British vessels. In fact, Crispin ended up in Port de Pay because of a privateer. During the journey from Newcastle, Delaware to Jeremy, a French Corsair captured and rerouted the vessel to Port de Pay, and Crispin soon dropped his slave disguise and found freedom and employment in the city. Now, upon learning of Crispin's location, Girard immediately pled his case to French revolutionary leaders in Saint-Domingue, and he chose his words very carefully. In a letter to Etienne Levaux, uh, the governor general of the colony from 1793 to 1796, Girard complained about the pending lawsuit and asked Laveau to order Crispin back to Philadelphia to testify against Laurel, the accused enticer. Yeah. Girard emphasized that Crispin was not his slave, but a servant under contract, since, as Girard put it, Philadelphia was the first to pass a decree in favor of universal liberty. Now, by stressing, if not exaggerating, freedom in Philadelphia, Girard tried to show his support for the 1794 abolition decree of the French Revolutionary Government. This was somewhat disingenuous uh, on Girard's part. He was a slave owner and had a good deal of contempt for the French Republican commissioners in Saint-Domingue, referring to them in another context as, quote, a ban of ignorant men ruling over slaves. So Girard's assertion reflected his awareness of the governor general's uh, politics. A confidant of the black leader Toussaint Louverture, Laveau held steadfast to the revolutionary ideal of general liberty, and he advocated the incorporation of newly freed black men into the French state as citizens. Laveau had no problem seeing through Girard's obsequious overtures mm -hmm. and rejected his request with indignation. His retort is worth quoting at length. <clears throat> you must know very little of me to dare to hope that in defiance of our glorious constitution I would consent to force a man against his own will to leave the land of liberty where he has taken refuge. In coming to Port de Pay, Crispin has come to enjoy liberty. In Philadelphia, he was a slave. Have I the right to order him to take up his chains again? Assuredly not. Yet Laveau overstated the certainty of freedom in Saint-Domingue. Many areas of the colony refused to adhere to the 1794 decree, and vicious racist-inspired violence erupted even in Republican cities, including Port de Pay. Black San Domingans resented the French government's reinstatement of the plantation regime, and in February 1796, just months after Laveau wrote his scathing reply to Girard, plantation laborers rebelled in the mountains around Port de Pay. That said, Laveau replied to Girard with such conviction because he, and in his view, the French Revolutionary regime as well, were committed to making freedom and racial equality a reality in Saint-Domingue. The colony promised to become a refuge from slavery, if it was not quite so already, and so he, unlike Girard, attributed Crispin's actions to his desire for freedom and citizenship. In Laveau's account, Crispin understood the meaning of the cockade he wore, and he believed that he would be a free man in Saint-Domingue. Laveau's rebuttal escaped Girard. And he clung to the enticement story, pestering contacts in Saint-Domingue to find out from Crispin why he had listened to Laurel. Girard's obstinacy, to some degree, stemmed from his fears about Laurel's lawsuit. Without Crispin's testimony, victory would elude Girard, and it did. In November 1797, three years after Crispin had run away, Girard and Laurel struck an agreement in which Girard paid the Frenchman $800 in damages, as well as covered his legal expenses. 
This was a substantial sum, perhaps more than the initial contract for Crispin was worth. A few days later, Girard wrote, I have at last settled with Joseph Laurel, and he offered no further comment. And, and yet the case invites it. Girard's concern about Laurel's lawsuit explains only in part his interpretation of Crispin's flight to Saint-Domingue. At the core of Girard's reaction lay a different idea about what liberty could and should mean for black and colored people. Girard thought manumission sufficed. Crispin was indentured, and after his term of service expired, he would be legally free. Girard could not envision a future in Philadelphia or in Saint-Domingue in which men of color enjoyed the rights of citizens. In contrast, Crispin's vision of freedom went beyond emancipation. It entailed full participation in society as a citizen, a goal that remained elusive for many African Americans, even in free Philadelphia. In the mid-1790s, the Haitian Revolution offered the promise for all men to pursue freedom in its most expansive application to date. And in this sense, Haiti became, as Laveau described it, the true land of liberty. Crispin's trajectory flows in a direction that is different, actually, from the migrations I, I follow in my book. I am mostly concerned with refugees leaving Saint-Domingue for the United States, but Crispin's path and Girard's pursuit of him reverses that trend. And yet, Girard and Crispin's experiences with the Haitian Revolution bring to light issues and sensibilities that stand at the center of this book. Their intertwined story helps us to think more deeply about what it meant to live in an era of revolutionary change. They demonstrate how residents of the early republic, be they elite white men or colored indentured servants, were enmeshed in the broader Atlantic world and therefore affected by its ever-shifting currents in manifold and unexpected ways. This realization encourages us to reconsider foundational myths about the foundation of the United States. Contrary to ingrained ideas about US exceptionalism, it is only by looking outside the nation's borders and appraising its engagement with the wider world that we come to understand the making of the early American Republic. Thank you. Is the fact that he's from the Indian subcontinent at all at play in his story? Or mm -hmm. I mean, leaving is he still just a man of color, or is there a sense of difference? That My sense is that from Laveau doesn't comment on that. Like he sees, he's more concerned with his his status, um, which he sees as being bound and hence enslaved, um, and less with um, less with his precise. Uh, origin, right? Um, it's sort of the attempt of the French Revolutionary regime to be colorblind. So it doesn't really matter um, uh, what Crispin is by any kind of racial designation. He is, he is a man, and he is free, and he is therefore a citizen. Where did you find the story? I mean, did it come uh, in this normal story? Did, did it strike that you, was this like a, an amazing discovery? How? It was, of course, an amazing discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you think any differently? Um, actually, I, um, I, I spent a month at the American Philosophical Society. Um, thank you, American Philosophical Society, for the money to be there. Um, and I knew that Stephen Girard, he, he is perhaps the biggest merchant in Philadelphia, the wealthiest one. He has a large correspondence. Uh, he has a francophone background. So it made sense that refugees would be contacting him. So I looked at his correspondence um, to see, um, uh, to actually trace refugees. And uh, while it was, I was reading sort of volumes and volumes of correspondence, this story unfolded and sort of uh, scattered among the letters. And there's very little. Uh, there's only really one biography of Girard that was written in the early 20th century, and um, they had misidentified Crispin as somebody from the West Indies. And then when I discovered he was from Malabar, like, how cool is that? Um, <laughs> and so the, the whole thing took on a, a life of its own. And um, there's, a, there's a chunk of the story that I, I excised um, because of time constraints, but the whole dealings between uh, uh, Girard and Laurel 
are, are just amp up to this incredible, incredible level where they're sort of fighting about Republican politics. There's another subcontinental Indian running around that they think is Crispin. <laughs> There's a case of mistaken identity. Gerard sends um, a refugee in to, uh, sort of to pretend to be a friend of Laurel to try and wheedle a confession out of him. Um, there are protests in the street of Norfolk over Gerard and Laurel. So that sort of explodes in interesting ways. So, and the fact that you see kind of the Haitian Revolution affecting these two men's lives um, so intimately was obviously just, you know, gravy. Um, <laughs> and, and it was the most, actually, I have to admit, it's the most extended story I, I found in that way. And that I, I never came across, at least on the US, large caches of refugee correspondence. Um, so Girard's is perhaps one of the largest and just truly the most fantastic. Um, the correspondence, you have correspondences in English, I assume? Uh, Girard is, is Girard is, Girard is in French. Okay. And so the answer that he gets from Le Vaux, Le Vaux yeah. are also in French. Mm -hmm. And that, that, how does that play in the larger uh, mm -hmm. political discourse of people like Jefferson, who of course knew French very well, mm -hmm. does it even matter? I mean, is it even a concern? Right. Is, is it, in other words, is the discussion, because it's in French, somehow outside the purview of large well, right. sections or of the population? Or acknowledge that freedom is slightly different from liberté, mm -hmm. or, you know, no. no, I mean, Too they sort of, they see it as, 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 one, in, as one and the same. I, they aren't... <laughs> They aren't, very, they aren't that good with their French, um, <laughs> right? I mean, even so Jefferson's Jefferson pretty good, even uh, Jefferson's included. Yeah. Like, um, so, <laughs> I mean, all the, and people are increasingly taking French in the 1790s. Right. It becomes part of the vogue to, to do it. But what's interesting, too, is that in newspapers, you see all the major decrees that come out of um, Saint-Domingue during the Revolution and, and out of France from the National Assembly. Uh, you see... Um, French speakers and their letters being translated into English. You have newspapers that are printed um, in double columns, French on one side, English on the other, so that you can sort of read them side by side, so made to appeal to both constituencies. So they aren't, they aren't analyzing the language, um, but, they're, and, but they're making sure it actually does get translated into English and, and disseminated. So 